Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. I apologize to the UREC. I'm, I'm going to give a Blackboard talk, but as you'll see, this is going to be one of many rules I'm going to break during this talk. I'm going to break several rules. This is the first rule, Blackboard talk. I've given this talk before. Sorry? <laughs> Apologies for that. I never read your emails. Now you know it, okay? <laughs> So I always start this kind of call by having a poll here. So let's consider the number of dimensions of space-time. And the question is, is this four? Is this bigger than four? Is this smaller than four? Who votes for four? Hands up. <laughs> Who votes for bigger than four? Hands up. Interesting. Who votes for smaller than four? Hands down. OK, that's interesting. <laughs> So it's very curious how this changes with the audience. Obviously, if you have astronomers, actually it's curious here, quite a few people said four. If you give this talk to astronomers, obviously everything you see, what you see is all there is. It's basically one possible approach. Obviously, if you like in string theory camp, this is what happens. People will like bigger than four. This community, I'm not very surprised, this community likes very much the idea that there is this thing called dimensional reduction. And in fact, smaller than four is something you get from holography, for example. Maybe it could be wire and hologram, and the fundamental world is actually lower dimension. The idea I'm going to be based on, basing this talk on, is the idea that the dimensionality actually runs. So depending on the energy scale, you could actually have all these. The answer could be yes to all of these things. So specifically, I'm going to assume in this case that we started four dimensions in the inter infrared and ultraviolet, we go to two. The reason why you guys like this is because it makes life a lot easier, okay? And you're lazy. So the reason why string theory is like D equals whatever is because it makes their life easier and they're lazy, okay? But it's a, a matter of convenience. What I'm going to be doing is basically phenomenology. And this talk is basically this idea. This was discovered, as you know, in CDTs initially. It's been rediscovered all over the place since in quantum gravity or Java leaf sheets being a pointing case. Um, not clear it's a bandwagon effect or it's a real thing, but it does look like there is this kind of presence, this ubiquity of two dimensions in the ultraviolet. What I'm going to be doing is try to relate these two or other things. So point number two, we look at the sky and we find scale invariance or something near scale invariance in the fluctuations. Okay, so specifically what this means is that if I look at the curvature fluctuation, this goes approximately like minus three halves of the wavelength. It's very interesting, inflation is one explanation. I'm going to be trying and connect this thing with this directly, without inflation. So just plug this into this and it works. I need one more assumption, and this assumption is the third one, and the idea is that in the UV, maybe gravity switches off. What this means, I'll make clear later on. In fact, what it means is that you have to ask all matter to be conformally coupled to gravity. If these three things are basically, what I'm going to show is that these three things work in tandem with each other. So if you assume these and these, you get these, and vice versa. There is an interconnection between these three things. We have proved these by we, I mean my, my mafia in Rome. So there's a few of them here. Giovanni has left, so I can... I can say horrible things about him. Um, we actually proved that using Java leaf sheets, or your Java leaf sheet scalar, I should say, you can actually explicitly show these things work in tandem. Um, we actually conjecture that this is general. And by general, I mean either things which violate Lorentz invariance or things which are only deformations of Lorentz invariance, like DSR. This is a completely general thing, conjecture. This was the conjecture we actually made in this essay, we submitted to the Gravity Foundation essay competition. So Giovanni is not here, I can tell you the dirty things. He was furious that we got second place. Whereas I was really happy we got the second place. Because um, the first place was Tooft, okay? And uh, we only got the second place because Tooft got the first one. And he actually wrote an essay claiming that the missing symmetry we have in quantum gravity is conformal symmetry which is basically what this assumes. The way we come into this is really quite different. It's really from cosmology perspective, but I'll try and explain what that means. 
Okay, so this is the plan of the talk. Let me start with these guys here. Let me just give you an idea of why these various things are related. So blackboard talk, I'll have to write big because this is really a small blackboard and a huge um, amphitheater. No, well, I'm gonna basically I'm going to uh, violate Lorentz invariance here. No, 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 no. So this works with both these both cases. <laughs> so you're just telling me that the conjecture is crap, basically. But it's not. I mean. <laughs> Okay, I'll explain. I, ca I, I can explain the conjecture rigorously here, but I'm going to do the calculation. I'll show you. Um, but this violates Lorentz invariance. You're quite right. You know what my attitude about that is? That we don't know any quantum mechanics. We're just doing things the wrong way around, and we just don't know what we're doing. Yes, yes, we can. We can conjecture. <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. I will. I agree with you. It's easier to break Lorentz invariance. Whether this is inconsistent or whether it's inconsistent with the other assumptions you've made, is this the big question? Because you told me about spectral representation, quantum field theory tools, which maybe are not valid at all, and I think that's a problem. Exactly. Okay, I'll write you. <laughs> I'm very happy. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. No, but in a way, you see, the point is that this is that that is point number four. If I take this, and I was just trying not to to go into there yet. Okay. So this is a it's a very it's a very important point. Okay. Uh, we the conjecture that this is general. Here, this is a conjecture. No one knows. So this, in a way, this is a question of how do I couple DSR with gravity? It's exactly the same issue. You're basically telling me I cannot couple DSR with gravity. DSR, doubly special relativity, because it's a Lorentz invariant way to deform the symmetries. Because you don't know anything about it. <laughs> sure. So the loopholes could be. So the loopholes could be in what do you mean by Lorentz invariance? Obviously, you cannot have strict Lorentz invariance, okay? Or it could be in the quantum field theory tools you're using. I agree with that. Yeah. Sure. No, I know. I know. I know, I know what you know, and I'm perfectly happy to break the rules of everything, including the rules used in that calculation. <laughs> sure, sure. No, you should know which rules you're breaking. Fair enough. Now this is a good conversation. I like this. I like this. <laughs> okay, I'm going to run out of time if I do. Okay, so let me actually get on with this guy first and show you how this is true there, and then we'll kind of move on and see. Um, the basic thing here is a modified dispersion relation, which you do find for the ojava lifshitz scalar. So already here, there's a question. This is not the graviton. It could be the graviton. This is like a scalar which has the same dispersion relation. And this is the fundamental thing. Let's assume I write it this way. And basically, gamma equals 2 is the case which is interesting. So this dispersion relation, um, the salient feature is that E is proportional to P cubed in the UV, which means the speed of light is proportional to P squared. Okay? And what actually happens is that this dispersion relation, as I will be showing, uh, does represent this phenomenon of dimensional reduction in the UV. Uh, also, the, he has this property, and then I'll tell you what this means in that case. Obviously, you break Lorentz invariance if you do that in a very simple way. Don't change anything else, the volume element, etc. But let's work with that to begin with. So Julie is going to tell you a lot about measures of dimensionality, because one big question here is what I mean by dimension, right? Um, there's all these tools people use, spectral dimension, etc. There's a very simple way to actually see that I have a running of dimension to 2 when gamma equals 2. And it's very simple. Um, so this thing has a varying speed of light, as you can see there. People always say varying speed of light. I can always redefine the unit to make the speed of light 1. Of course you can, but then the non-trivial effects will appear somewhere else. So, you know, you always have two frames, a VSL frame or an MDR frame, and the linearizing frame, we call it, 
which in this case would be very simple. You could just look at this guy and call this p tilde, right? p tilde square. So specifically, what you can do is define p tilde in the UV, which is p cubed. So a very simple exercise for you, work out the measure in momentum space, okay? The measure initially was p, let's call it p square, the pde, change units, and what you find is, effectively, I ended up with a Hausdorff dimension, which is 1 plus, let me call this in general, d minus 1 here, d 1 plus gamma. Okay, very general property here. So my attitude has always been you should look at dimensionality by linearizing your, your crazy variables, which give you a varying speed of light, see what happens where the non-trivial effects appear. They appear in the measure, compute the Hausdorff dimension of the measure. That's a very simple way to characterize this transition, this running of dimensionality. And you can see when d equals 3 and gamma equals 2, which is what I advocated here, this thing gives you 2. So you go from 4 to 2. OK, so very simple exercise. This is Jacobians. Everyone should know how to do that. Um, why is it I can, do, I can find this result here? OK, so first of all, why do I have varying speed of light here in the first place? By varying, I mean time-dependent speed of light. So let's start trying to do cosmology with this. So first of all, point number one, what I have is an energy dependence in the speed of light. But this becomes a time-dependent speed of light in cosmology because of a very simple thing, which is whenever I look at P, which is my physical momentum, this thing relates or translates into the momenta used by cosmologists by this expression, because you always look at the moving momentum. Okay, very important point. Every calculation in cosmology, you put a label on a mode, and then you let it stretch with expansion. Okay? So this A is A of t. And what this means is clearly that I have a time-dependent speed of light for a given uh, mode just because I have expansion. So the expansion is a machine of turning an energy-dependent speed of light into a time-dependent speed of light. A very simple point, but people miss it sometimes. So I have a very speed of light with something in which you're scanning the, rainbow, the rainbow using the cosmological expansion. Point number two, there's already been a problem here earlier on in the week. You have to do the calculation, okay? You can't just lift results from inflation. Okay, and the assumptions here, which I'm going to drop later on, they're not really that important, are going to be the following. I'm going to assume in this frame that I have Einstein gravity, this is going to be not needed eventually, and that I have a high-order derivative representation of these, which means I just do my p going to y radiant, and then I'm very careful not to have any time deformations here, okay, because that would give me ghosts and everything else. So I put everything in the spatial momentum. If I do that, then I, it's the usual calculation. You just have to do everything from the first principles. You find the second-order action, and this is the second-order action you find. You basically find your d mu, d eta, then you end up with this guy, a square, expansion factor, your curvature fluctuation, which is that guy which appears there, square plus c square, k square, zeta square. Okay, you have to do the calculation. This is the kind of thing you cannot just go and say, we well, inflationary people did this before, I'm just going to lift the calculation. This guy here is a famous z variable, which is a over cs if I have k inflation, if k inflation is a theory with a varying speed of light, or speed of sound, if I could do that with the non-trivial kinetic terms. k means kinetic, right? If you do that, the CS appears there. If I do this, it does not appear. Okay? Simple technical point, but everything is different if you don't realize this. Say it again. The argument is go sit down and do the calculation. So very important, if I have a K, if I have, so K of X is this thing. So suppose X is this guy, d mu phi, d mu phi. So this is usually how I have a varying speed of sound in inflation. And this was done to change the, the tensor to scalar ratio, et cetera, et cetera. If you do this, you do the calculation, blah, 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 you end up with the CS there. If instead you say, all I want to do is have a dispersion relation here, I do P to P gradient, I end up with a higher order derivative theory then you don't, okay? Okay, how do I do calculations? Next, well, um, there's a very, now it, now it is actually standard procedure because I'm just solving differential equations. So you can go and actually lift off everything 
from inflation. So Z is basically V over A, V over Z, but Z is A here. And with this transformation, I end up with this nice equation. C a square, K square, A double prime over A, V equals zero. So very important equation. This is essentially how cosmology becomes cookery. You're cooking two things. You're basically looking at modes inside the horizon. They're just harmonic oscillators with an omega, which may have a varying C or not. These are modes inside the horizon. You look at this guy here, it's an inverted harmonic oscillator. So this is nothing but change instability. So it's big modes left the horizon. They basically subject to an instability, which is the gravitational instability. Something which is dense becomes denser. Okay? And inflation, what you do is, so how do you do the calculation in inflation? Well, you go inside the horizon. This guy is 1 over square root of k, so it's not scale invariant. This is the bunch Davis vacuum you choose for inflation. It doesn't go like 1 over k to the 3 halves. So this is inside the horizon. Then you look at outside the horizon. So if you ignore this term here, you integrate this simply as v proportional to a. Where do I match these two? Well, the horizon is around here. So remember, E is conformal time, k is moving k, so this is where you cross the horizon. Then you find that this guy here has a function of k. When the a is the sitter, a is proportional to 1 over eta. You just work it out. a proportional to 1 over eta for the sitter gives you f of k, k to the minus 3 halves. So very important, the modes are not scale invariant, the vacuum fluctuations are not scale invariant inside the horizon. Modes leave the horizon at different times, so then they get amplified differently, and this is what tilts something which is not scale invariant or something scale invariant. Okay, inflation C is one, right? Yeah. Wait, I'll do it in a bit. <laughs> so this is what, I will do this in a bit, okay? So this is, in, this is a general framework which reduces to inflation if I make C a constant, okay? For one, specifically one. So this is the argument for inflation. Ba uh, let me repeat this. I have this fact that different modes leave the horizon at different times, therefore they get amplified differently by the gene's instability. And if, if this, the, the, the kinematics of the cooking, the way I'm cooking this is the sitter, this becomes scale invariant. The way it works here, so here is completely different, right? Here, V is proportional to 1 over a square root of omega, okay? What is the C? Omega is C, K, this is my C. Yes, Tom is love, you get this? So you can see immediately what happens there. This goes like 1 over K to the 3 halves times A, right? So I have the extra power of K there, which is, gives me exactly the scale invariance. The modes are already scale invariant. If I have a dispersion relation, which I showed here represents reduction to 2, the vacuum fluctuations are scale invariant to begin with, inside the horizon. Okay, what happens next? Well, this was done before I did this calculation like a, like a PhD student, sorry, <laughs> a long time ago. You can just solve this with Bessel functions. And you find this funny result, that actually outside the horizon, the vacuum fluctuations are scale invariant for whatever equation of state. It doesn't need to be inflation, doesn't need to be anything. And the reason is very simple. Now what I do is the same matching of modes, A, F of K, and the A is cancelled. So things are already growing inside the horizon at the same rate they grow outside the horizon. So it doesn't really matter when I leave the horizon. So in this kind of scenario, I don't have inflation, but I start with something scale invariant initially, and end up with something scale invariant in the end, because there really is no sense of horizon here, which leads me to point number three. Okay? So point number three is this issue. What do I mean by gravity switching off? I actually assume I'm saying gravity. So what is happening here? Okay, so let me just finish with that bit there. So, um, so which thing is zero? Sorry, this thing there. Okay. Well, but you know, of course, there is a crossing of horizon. There is a crossing of horizon, but it doesn't matter. No. So you end up with something of randos, and you do the calculation, you end up with scale invariance, whatever the equation of state. Miracle. 
I did this calculation, or part of this calculation was followed up in Rome. Rome is the seat of the miracles, right? So I thought, well, maybe that's the reason we're in Rome. Well, in practice, th there's no miracles even in Rome. There's a good reason why this happens here. There really is no horizon. And this is, so every time you find a miracle, it's because you've assumed things you didn't need to assume. So you've assumed all this stuff in here, sorry, there. Did I really need to assume my order derivative or Einstein gravity or anything? Okay, uh, do I have colored chalk? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. You guys are so efficient. Okay, so let me try and do the same trick here. So I told you there are two frames here. It's a bit like in Brand's Dicke. I have an Einstein frame and a Jordan frame. So I can have a VSL or an MDR frame, uh, a frame in which everything goes um, into the measure. The interactions are different as well. So every time I change frames, if I have non-trivial effects in one frame, I'll have non-trivial effects in the other. It may not look like a varying C, but something will be there. Okay? Well, let me now see what happens with the gravity theory. Okay? So let me change this completely. So let me do this change there. This is what happens. Okay? You're going to get a tau here. Let me call this guy Y. So there are going to be dots in here. This guy disappears, so there's no varying C in the new frame. I changed the unit so that there's no varying C. My time unit was changed, blah, blah, blah. This guy here became two-dimensional, etc., etc. The Y which appears here, the other one was called Z, is basically this. And you have to do the calculation, but basically if you insert this there, you find that this thing goes like K, you lose all the time dependence. So in other words, if I change the units, this guy disappears. Now, this happens actually if I assume Einstein gravity and I have a radiation dominated universe. Why? Because radiation is conformally invariant, okay? So the equation for radiation is actually one in which there's no gravitational instability. Okay? Radiation is conformally coupled. What seems that it's happening here is that if I look at things carefully, I'm saying that in this frame, gravity is such that there is universal conformal coupling between matter and gravity. And you see this explicitly here. Basically, this miracle happens here without any dependence on the equation of state because this happened as well in the right frame. Okay? So let me... How long have I got? 15 minutes. Okay, good. So this is effectively this bit here. And I think this is non-controversial. This is effectively just your Java Lifshitz uh, theory or your Java Lifshitz scalar. So what you see in here is that effectively if you look at things carefully, these assumptions are not that important. What is actually happening is this universal coupling, uh, the universal conformal coupling between matter and gravity, which is why I have this pervasive scale invariant if I have this right power in here, which I know from here represents dimensional reduction from 4 to 2. Okay, what is the conjecture here? It looks like this is completely general. Okay, at least I, I will prove it's general here and here. This one is actually a conjecture with the... Uh, with the caveats. Shall we call them caveats? Are you happy if I call it caveats? <laughs> okay. So if I call them that, then okay. No, it's all right. Yes. Yes. No, the background is not inflated. It's Friedman like background. Yeah, yeah. So one thing I didn't clarify here. So of course of course an important issue here in the, in the other the other frame is that the modes must start inside the horizon. So in, in That's right. That's right. So even here, even when I change all these things, I still have, of course, a background which is evolving with gravity, right? So this is the second order action, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. 
That's right. So in fact, in here, it doesn't really matter. I could have done, I could have done this first, this linearization, and then transition to field theory. Or I could have done the transition to field theory straight away here, which is what I did there. Okay. So it's going to be relevant now, okay, I will, you know, to get ahead of myself, since you are asking the question. When I go to these cases here, it's not optional. I must linearize first and then do the transition to field theory, because then I have higher order derivative in time. I don't want that. Okay. The gamma is 2. So it's fixed by this, because I want this representation from 4 to 2. No, 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 no. I mean, that's completely, I mean, this could go from 4 to f whatever, right? So, in which case, the NS would not be 1. So, in fact, you know, I don't want to play this game. I promised myself I wasn't going to, but you asked the question. If I want to put 0.96 here, I have to put 2.02 there. And there are people who like fractal dimensions, not me. Okay, okay so let me move on. Um, in fact, Ask away questions, because everything I'm going to say now is going to be just schematic. But let me just tell you, this is more general than what might look like. And specifically, so the thing I want to say now is that, of course, I can have Lorentz invariant violation theories, which are more general than this one. I could, for example, I should never raise this. I could have had a 2, 1 plus gamma t here, and then a p, which is 2, 1 plus gamma x etc. Okay, so I can play the same game as before. Well, you get a dh, which is a generalization of the formula I gave you before. So there's other solutions, okay? There's not just one way. It's very important. There's not a single way to represent 4 to 2 with a dispersion relation. This is, for example, here with d equals 3, I could have gamma t gamma x equals 1. And this would work as well. So even within Lorentz invariant violating theories, there's many different ways, or at least two different ways, of representing this process. But more important, and this is the point where it's going to be interesting, I could have done something, for example, in asymptotic Einstein gravity, I basically end up with these expressions in which the D'Alembertian appears as a power, typically square, right? And you can prove, using the same game here, you end up with dh, which is 1 plus d, 1 plus gamma, how do I know this? Since exactly the same exercise, okay? So I'm talking about exactly the same exercise of linearizing, computing the Hausdorff dimension, see what happens. DSR, well, DSR, which is the thing, I should have called this Capo Poincare here. This is like a minefield for in insulting people, but you know, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. So there is a Casimir, which Julie is going to present in my more detail, that thing with hyperbolic signs and everything. In this case, already in the original frame, your Casimir is deformed and your measure is deformed. So the two things are deformed here. So if I put a 1 plus gamma here, I can generalize everything I've done before, and you end up with a dh, which is 2d, 1 plus gamma. In fact, it's curious. DSR, if I just take that Casimir you guys all use, DSR is a running from 4 to 6. Okay, I'm not sure you understand this, I'm not trying to understand this, but basically the same story. I could have this gamma equals 2, then I could represent, if I basically square, or rather cube, that Casimir, I do end up with the right running. Okay, so there's at least uh, two cases in which I can, in a Lorentz invariant framework, represent 4 to 2, playing exactly the same game as in Ojabo Lipschitz. Okay, what happens with the rest of the calculation? So this here is controversial, and I'm going to conjecture this. This here can be proved. Okay, so the idea is the following. These guys all have weird deformations in the energy. If I do the transition to field theory there, I end up with a higher order derivative theory in time. That's really bad form, okay? I said I was going to break all the rules, but some rules just basically get into trouble. So the idea here is to do basically the transition. I said before, into these units, the linearizing units, and then, once you've done that, thank you very much, I can do the calculations of the vacuum fluctuations. So this is what happens, and this is an interesting result. You can read the paper. The paper is quite technical. We wrote a paper recently in which we show, in general, that if you assume the following, so if you take a field theory in which this is true, 
So effectively, I've linearized the theory already. So my theory is a quadratic Lagrangian, like any other. Everything is in the measure. The measure is completely deformed. So if I basically postulate this, but with the deformed measure there, so I have a delta function adapted to the deformed measure, then I can prove the following result, which is very interesting. Every time I have dh equals 2 in the uv, I have nx equals 1. Completely general, OK? And specifically, in fact, I think Julie is going to mention more about this. There is even a formula, which is this. So people talk very much about operational definitions of dimension, specifically spectral dimensions and things like that, which are not very well defined physically. Maybe the spectral index of the vacuum fluctuations is actually the physical way in which you should look at these things. You definitely have a nice way to actually measure the dimensionality of space by looking at it. And it appears to be the case in all these theories that whenever the dimension is 2, this guy is 1, which is effectively this result here, completely general. So this is true without gravity. So the question now, and this is where this is a bit controversial, it's tempting to postulate 3. And I am well aware so that this is controversial, but the idea is, if I do say that this is true, But this, this doesn't break Lorentz invariant. No, but, th but these guys do not break Lorentz invariant. So th no, I didn't. It's a different representation. It's a nonlinear representation. Then it is controversial. No, it is controversial. I think it is controversial. I mean, it would be very easy for me to say, oh, yeah, we're all friends. But I think it is actually controversial. Yeah. OK, so just one thing. Um, we had a big argument with that guy, Arzan, over there. This is actually inconsistent with DSR. No, wait, wait, wait. I didn't finish, right? <laughs> so the important thing is this is what I'm postulating here is just when I compute this with a vacuum, right? So it's just a two part if I only probe the two particle sector, then it's okay. If I probe the three particle sector interactions and things like that, I cannot assume that. Namely because I, I must deform the, the addition rule in, uh, in these theories to prevent the introduction of a preferred frame. So if I have two particles, so the three, three particles are fine. From the moment I introduce interactions and I start adding momentum, Right. So I have actually not the form, but only for the free theory, which is all I need to compute the vacuum fluctuations, is when I put the vacuum expectation value of this thing. Yeah. So this is interesting, because we were okay, I, I won't have time to go into that. But in fact, one way, so this is a bit embarrassing, because I'm saying there is no way to experimentally distinguish between these different theories, right? In fact, this is just a power spectrum. It could be a bispectrum distinguishes between them precisely because of this. Yeah? You agree? Good, good. OK, where was I? Right, so what did we think about? We basically thought about the following. So there are several things here. And in fact, I already told you one, which is this issue about the bispectrum. There's other things, which is n is not 1. n is 0.96. The other one is gravity waves. There's, there might be gravity waves. What fixes the gravity waves? So I could tell you how to solve that with the Java leaf sheets. I could go back here and tell you how this is done. In fact, let me just very briefly say how it is done. So one way to do it is to have a running, a very slow running from 4 to 2. You can actually fix the 0.96 if you do that. You could run to a fractal dimension here. You could get 0.96 here. 10 to the minus 5, I never told you, no one asks, how do I get 10 to the minus 5? Well, it's because I must have a scale. C is 1 nowadays, right? So at some point, C must go like P cube or whatever, C P square. That scale over the Planck scale, which is the lambda I wrote before, is what fixes 10 to the minus 5. Now, of course, what I could do is have different lambdas, for example, for tensor modes and scalar modes. So you have different amplitudes for the two. This is what fixes the ratio between tensor and scalar modes. But that is actually what happens with Ojava leaf sheets. So that's a very specific thing for Ojava leaf sheets. The conjecture in that essay, so basically gravity foundation means you can bullshit, and that's what we did. The conjecture is, let's take, these, let's take the Ojava leaf sheets calculation not literally. 
And let's just take the philosophy here. So the philosophy is that somehow there is indeed a fundamental conformal invariance in the universe which is broken at some point. And the idea is that basically gravity is switched off before something breaks it, and this is what unleashes gravity at the Big Bang, and that mechanism, the specific symmetry-breaking mechanism, should fundamentally actually explain these things as well. So rather than fiddling with parameters and trying to explain this NS being 0.96, trying to change the lambda here, that gamma there, and so on, trying to make the two not exactly two. I think we should not take this to, see, to, to literally just take the lesson from this, and then basically question, query this mechanism, which broke the conformal invariance, query that mechanism with respect to this phenomenology, okay? What would make R.01, for example, fundamentally, and what would make N equals 0.96? So I think I'll leave it here, okay? I'm not going to overrun or anything. And this is basically conjecture, and I'll leave it there. Uh, I have uh, 100 of questions, but uh, I'm eating myself. <laughs> One. We have time. Uh, I don't, you know, we have time. Okay, uh, so. Uh, you ha have you ever a prediction for R parameter, uh, for inflation, for... Uh, for what? For R, R parameter. For yes, R so um, yeah, I started mentioning that. Okay, okay. Well, what is the... I have uh, that prediction, but that prediction is for Java lift sheets, okay, specifically. Okay, but, uh, so Lorentz invariance uh, or not? Uh, no, in these other theories we haven't done any of the work, right? Okay. No. So Ojava lift sheets, what you do is you do this calculation for two things. One, what people call the Ojava lift sheet scalar. Yeah. The other one for the proper Ojava lift sheet's graviton, okay? And then what you find is you always have this 1 plus lambda p square factor in your dispersion relations, right? And this lambda here is what fixes the amplitude of the fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Now, it could be this lambda is different for gravity, for tensors, and for scalars. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, I have a curious thing. Your R, this ratio is also... So, C is proportional to p square for the graviton and for matter, but the constant could be different in front. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, what I'm saying is that the ratio between the speed of gravity and the speed of matter, or massless matter, in the UV, is what gives you the R, which is interesting, right? So, you could actually say, and in fact, it was our initial conjecture, there were papers by people who said they could actually compute this number and actually relate this number to the number of particles in the model, okay? Maybe you could go fundamentally and say the graviton only has one spin, the other things have very, very diff particles with different spins, it's possible, there's one paper in which it was a conjecture, you could actually compute this ratio. That would actually give you an exact prediction for R, which is cool. Okay. Uh, another question. But I didn't want to be too literally, because this is kind of... Another question regarding uh, maybe the third point. Uh, the, vile t the initial vile tensor of your uh, theory is uh, zero? Or Yo, the what tensor? Vile tensor, vile tensor. Because there are some uh, proposals uh, uh, of the past from Perros, or some kind of these people proposing that uh, if you start uh, from a vile tensor at this is zero, uh, you have a conformal invariance of perturbations. So I would like to get uh, if there is some, uh, somehow similar in this proposal. I uh, think we are mixing two things. So, um, by conformal invariance, I mean things are conformally coupled to gravity at the level of the second order action. So a Friedman model uh, is, okay, a Friedman yeah. model is, of course, conf is yeah. conformal to a, to a flat model. So this already happens with radiation, with Einstein gravity. It doesn't feel the expansion, right? You look at this, that equation which I wrote before, the, the genes instability term drops out for, for radiation. Here it drops out for everything, which is just what I need. So in one case, I explain what it meant. Here I conjecture, in this case, is okay, with caveats. Nothing to do with the vial tensor. I think, I think I know what you mean, but it's not that, okay? I'm not saying the solution is conformally invariant. It's a different issue. Uh, are you relating with these oscillators, which you have written on the table, uh, some field operator? I mean, for example, in field operator, what kind of plane waves you would introduce? Or you just write the oscillators uh, and, and go ahead? So, yeah, so this goes into this issue of how do I write the waves. So um, one of the people here in our collaboration is the speak non-commutative. I'm not one of them. So I refer you to him. You might be able to answer my que your question. I basically, so the statement there. <laughs> yeah. No, no, but I, I want to, I want to. 
So the thing I mentioned well, about addition is what happens when I multiply no, waves. No, because if you are serious, you want to get some kind of field theory later, yeah? No. You, no, if I if, if you are not serious, no, no, no. Okay. I think I think no. if you want to be serious, you want to. That's what Giovanni said earlier on. You want to connect with observations. No, because you see, and then the mathematicians will fill in the details. Ah, okay, but <laughs> you don't <laughs> know whether you you give something what what mathematicians can swallow. You know, this is the point. Well, my math my mathematical friend tells me it's safe at the level of the free function of the free. Michel is mathematical friend. Okay, that that I, I would suggest. It's you see, I have friends. A, I, I also have friends. An not axiom, many, but, but I, <laughs> some of them are mathematicians. He's a well. mathematical <laughs> one. Okay, are there other questions? There's one here. Well, yeah, I'm probably quite comfortable with uh, uh, what many people might not be comfortable with, but I have some doubts. Namely, uh, you mentioned towards the end that the amplitude, uh, the Colby normalization, is determined by the value of uh, this speed of sound. Right? You're not going to come up with a transplanting problem, are you? Do you think that the value you need is natural? Because my impression oh. is not. Is universe natural? I mean, that's such well, that's just shows so so much prejudice, you know. Just, uh, well, it's a large number, right? That you ten to the minus five is not a large number. Or ten to the plus, whatever. It's okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, one thing is to worry about, the, you know, insta instabilities I worry about, like the cosmological constant, blah, 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 all these things. Ten to the m you're always going to have a hierarchy. Ten to the minus five means you have, you have a hierarchy somewhere. You have to live with it. Why not? Maybe it, maybe it is a clue, right? The clue is exactly that there is a ratio between some fundamental length and the Planck length, and that's what gives you ten to the minus five. Yeah, everywhere, obviously. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so what? <laughs> Just because you say quantum gravitational doesn't mean you. <laughs> yeah, of course. I agree with that. Yeah. You're a minority here. <laughs> <laughs> there will still be time for a last question, if there isn't, then I will thank our speaker again. <laughs> <laughs>